learning languages through gaming. Is this a viable option? Well, as a professional teacher, because some of you must know already, but I do teach, I teach teenagers in high school, but sometimes they also ask me to, as a, they call me as a language expert, to teach high school professors how to teach. So yes, I'm a fully qualified teacher, and for the short answer to your question, yes, learning languages through video games and through gaming not only can be a viable and very effective way or method to learn foreign languages, but I'll tell you more, it can be much more effective than traditional book learning. However, in order for it to be effective, there are certain things and certain patterns that you need to follow. It's not just a matter of switching on a video game, playing for five hours and chatting with your friends. Of course, chatting in English or whatever language you're using will help you increase your abilities, but there is a much more effective way to do it, to maximize the time, to study, for example, for one hour, have fun, play video games and improve dramatically your language skills. So stay tuned to know more about this. Hello number ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Let's get immediately to the point. But let me draw my gladius first. So, yes, I'm a teacher and I strongly support the idea of learning languages through gaming. But as I said, there are some patterns and some ways, some methods that I myself use all the time, not only on my students, but also on myself to uh, increase your vocabulary, your pronunciation and your overall fluency in whatever, la whatever language you are studying. You see, many uh, teachers, many of my colleagues don't consider it to be a viable, don't consider video games to be a viable way, a viable options in language learning just because they haven't been brought up with it. But I have and I do support the idea of using new technology and utilizing new technology to increase your overall results. At the end of the day, as a teacher, what I always tell my students is, as long as you remember the words, the terminology, the grammar that I have taught you, I don't care how you do it. All that matters to me is that you remember them. Think about it. I mean, what have some of those traditional old school ways of learning things ever really done for us? I mean, if you think about it, so many high school students, and I know that because I work with them every day, many high school students, what do they do? They just learn a little bit of history, they get extremely bored, they just learn what they need to do to get to pass the tests, and then they forget everything about it. And unfortunately, this is what happens as well with languages. 10 years of English studies, I've studied five years of French, I've taken Italian at school, but I don't remember anything. And if you face an actual native, you won't be able to make yourself understood. You won't have an actual conversation. And yet, how many gamers are out there and how many people right now who are watching this video can testify to the fact that they have learned their English and they can actually understand what I'm saying because of gaming. But please pause the video and let me know in the comments if that's one of you. Here is the thing. Learning has to be fun. Forget, completely clear out this whole idea and huge misconceptions that many students have and many teachers have that in order to study something you have to get bored. It, it's boring, it's dull, repetitive, sit down and you're like, oh, I don't want to be here, I want to play video games, I want to go out with my friends. Well, let me tell you, not only learning doesn't have to be boring, it can be fun and it should be fun. If you have fun while you're studying something, the percentage of you actually remembering those things will be in exponentially higher. Why? Because you will have linked those memories, those words, for example, in language learning or even dates, for example, in historical learning, you will have linked them to an interesting and fun experience you have had. So whenever your brain tries to look through his folders when you actually need that word and looking through the whole, the entire database, it's going to be incredibly difficult to just remember a word you have read on a list, on a book. That's there are millions of memories like that. But when the memory is linked to an interesting fact, the actual synapses will be together in the same area of the brain. If you learn something while having fun or while having an interesting, exciting uh, experience, your brain will immediately find it because it will be very well catalogued. All right, this is all impressive. How do you do it? Well, this is the thing. 
Let's say you're playing Skyrim, and believe it or not, I actually have my students sometimes play Skyrim with me. Um, so what do you do? You're playing Skyrim, and what you need to do is whenever you go, let's say you go to Riverwood, what you gotta do is that you gotta describe everything you see. So of course you need to prepare beforehand. So in your class, what I normally do in my classes, I choose, for example, a topic which can be a natural topic, like, you know, Skyrim has got some beautiful landscapes to describe, and you could also do it to describe the people, but let's just focus on the landscape for now. So I just teach them, have them write all those words that they might need, which we will learn together today, and yes, we will learn them in three languages, because why not? This is the Metatons channel after all. So I'm going to teach you today, and I'm going to prove to you that this method works, because at the end of this video, you will have enough stuff to actually improve your ability to describe uh, natural areas and environment in English, Italian, and Japanese. Write down all the words you need, uh, wood, forest, river, cave, cavern, etc., and I'll get you a lot of those words in these languages now, just in a moment. And then you just keep the little notebook near you, you start playing the game, and anything you see, you say it, okay? So if you see, you can even say, I'm in a grove now, and I'm in front of a river. I can't really see the riverbed, but the water is rather clear. It's limpid, not murky. And as you can see, I have just practiced adjectives, nouns, and a little bit of grammar. You could describe the weather. You know those very uh, boring lessons of English or French or Spanish or whatever language you're learning, and it's like, the weather. Look at a ton of expressions and you just can't, you, you keep on reading them and forgetting. Read, forget, read, forget, read, forget. But no, it's just a matter of you're just reading a boring, dull, drab piece of paper. No, play your video game and try and describe the weather that you see. And each time, and sometimes, for example, if you're like, ah, but I wanted to practice uh, that now it's raining, but it's not raining at the moment, that's fine. When you say it's not raining, you have practiced it, okay? And you can say, for example, well, I thought it was raining, but it's actually drizzling at the moment. And there you go, you've practiced another expression. And you do this with your languages, you do it consistently. If you do this, for an hour of gameplay, and let me tell you, when I play my games, I always do it. I do it in Italian just because, I mean, I, I'm native in Italian, I don't actually need it, but I do it because I just select some very bizarre words that I like, and I just want to learn and, and start using. So I do it with Italian, I do it with English, of course, I do it with Japanese, and I do it with Mandarin Chinese, sometimes even in French. I do all of these languages, I do it on a daily basis, so whenever I actually play a little bit of video games, not that I have a lot of time to do that, but whenever I have time to play a little bit of video games, it's also time to practice my language skills. So let me give you an, an example. Let me show you how I would describe Riverwood in Skyrim. Here we are, Riverwood. Well, the first thing, of course, is the river. As I said, the water is clear. By getting closer, we will notice that alongside the left river bank, we can see a little bit of moss growing on top of the stones. We see that there is a mountain and it's rather foggy or perhaps misty. In order to assess whether it's foggy or misty, we would actually need to walk there. If we can't see much, it's foggy. If we can still see a little bit, it's misty. More details about the difference between mist and fog in the description below. This mist gives this landscape an opalescent appearance, which subdues colors. On the other side of the river, we will see these characteristic, typical, winding, cobbled streets, which will lead to Riverwood itself, the town we will describe now. On top of that mountain, we would most likely encounter a storm, or perhaps a gale, if not a blizzard. I find the houses in Riverwood to be particularly interesting. We've got stone walls for the ground floor, a wooden structure for the first floor, and the roofing is made of thatch. As we walk through the streets in Riverwood, we will notice that on one side we have fragments of stone wall covered in ivy, while on the other side we see a sort of fence, or perhaps picket fence. In town there is a water mill, and right next to it we can see a certain amount of timber and some logs that you can actually help splitting. Discussing the trees and the vegetation, well, regardless of the very cold weather, all the plants seem to have a luxuriant growth. You can clearly see the bark of the trees, the branches. They seem to keep livestock in town, so I would imagine that somewhere in this town we should be able to find a trough or a manger. Personally, I love the quaint houses present in Skyrim. Although I must say that probably living there 
could be difficult considering that there are areas with sparse vegetation and I'm quite sure the Skyrim would be a rather damp place. Okay, so as you could see, we could learn, I hope, uh, some interesting words by simply describing Riverwood. Imagine how much more we could learn. Like, for example, if we describe places such as Whiterun with the battlements used by the guards to uh, defend themselves or many other specific um, words and terminology for medieval castles. And if you just become a master at describing medieval looking uh, fantasy areas, then just change game. In fact, the other day I actually had one of my students describe what he was seeing while he was playing Mirror's Edge, a completely different kind of vocabulary that can be learned. Now, what's amazing about all of this is that you, the, you do this a couple of times, you will memorize everything. But I don't want you to believe me. Let's test it together. We will, now, of course, I went a little advanced with English, but let's move, it, move to basic description and let's do it in both Italian and Japanese. And you'll see how much you can remember if you just try this a couple of times. And I'm saying this for those of you who actually speak English as a first language. Okay, so in Italian, first of all, let's learn how to say there is, there are. So there is, we say c'è. There are, we say ci sono. So repeat after me. C'è, c'è, ci sono, ci sono. So for example, if I want to say there is a mountain, I will say c'è una montagna. Now link it together for a more fluent pronunciation. C'è una montagna. If I want to say there is a grove, I will say c'è un bosco. C'è un bosco. Now please notice that in the case of montagna, a or one what became una. And that's because montagna is a feminine noun. It finishes with an a or a in Italian. In the case of bosco, which is a masculine noun, we use un. But they both mean the same thing. One. So, considering now that the word for tree in Italian is albero, how would you say there is a tree? Okay, very good. C'è un albero. Link it together. C'è un albero. Okay, so now we can say there is blah blah. Let me give you some other words or nouns that you can use when you want to just say there is this, there is that. Villaggio. Villaggio, fiume, fiume. Although it finishes with an E, it's still a masculine noun. Un fiume, c'è un fiume. Lago, lago, animale, animale, animale. Caverna, caverna, grotta, grotta. C'è una grotta, c'è una caverna. Okay, now let's try and say that you are in a wood, you are in a forest. So you would say sono, which means am, in, which means in, una, a, foresta, forest. Sono in una foresta. You could say io sono in una foresta to say I am in a forest, but we Italians seldomly say Io, because it's already understood by the context because we conjugate the verb. So you don't need to say it and I'd rather you didn't because you would sound more natural. There are some situations in which you would say io, but we will get to that perhaps in another video. Okay, now let's try and say I am walking, I am running. To walk in Italian is camminare. Now, of course, we need to conjugate this and in order to say I am walking, you would say sto camminando. I can see that the sto is the verb stare and it's used as an auxiliary verb, just like in English when you say I am walking. Am is the auxiliary verb, walking is the main verb. And of course in English you add a suffix which is ing. In Italian we also add a suffix and in this case is ando. So sto camminando. Run, to run in Italian is correre, correre. Again we conjugate in a similar way. Sto, I am. Correndo, correndo. In this case, it's not correndo, it's correndo. We have several possibilities for the suffixes. We will get to the grammar another time. For now, just memorize the sound and repeat them. In order to say it's cold and it's hot, in Italian we say fa caldo, fa freddo. Fa caldo, 
fa freddo. It literally means makes hot, makes cold, or does hot, does cold, but in English you would translate it as it's cold, it's hot. Another possibility is to just say in Italian c'è caldo, c'è freddo. Literally means there is hot, there is cold. Of course in English you can't say it that way, but many Italians will make this mistake because in Italian you can. It's up to you what you want to use. I would suggest switch between the two systems. Japanese. So how do you say mountain in Japanese? Mountain is yama. Yama. Kawa. Kawa. Mura. Mura. Doubutsu. Doubutsu. Ki. Ki. Mori. Mori. If we are talking about inanimate objects, so, uh, you know, anything that is not a person or an animal, then you can say kawa and then you add the particle ga it's just a particle you don't really need to translate this into english for now aru aru means there is or also there are actually they're both the same in japanese there is no distinction between numbers or numericals in this case so you would say kawagaru kawagaru yamagaru yamagaru muragaru muragaru now, in order to speak more in a more gentle way, so if you're speaking to someone that you're not particularly close to, then you can use arimas, which is the tene or formal or gentle way of speaking. So it becomes yamagarimas, kawagarimas, muragarimas. In the case of dobutsu, since it's an animated, so it's it's an animal, you will say iru instead of aru, and imas instead of Arimas. So it becomes Doubutsu ga iru. Doubutsu ga iru. Doubutsu ga imas. Doubutsu ga imas. Okay, talking about the weather, if it's cold, you would say Samui des. Samui. Samui des. If it's hot, you would say Atsui des. Atsui des. Now des, it's actually the uh, verb to be and it is put at the end in Japanese. So you're basically saying cold is, hot is. Now normally with nouns, you can add da instead of des if you've got a certain level of, um, you know, a very close relationship to the person you're talking to because des is rather formal. So if you're talking to a, a younger person or someone who you, you are very close to, you, you wouldn't really say des. So you can say da and add a little yo for emphasis. So it becomes yama da yo, kawa da yo, Mura da yo. Now, in the case of adjectives like atsui and samui, because they are adjectives, they mean hot and cold, you can't add da yo directly, but you can if you add a little particle which is pronounced ng in Japanese. So it will become samuin da yo, atsuin da yo. Finishing up, how do you say walk to walk? and to run in Japanese so you can actually describe what you're doing which is exactly what I did yesterday while I was playing the video game Way of the Samurai. I just played it for an hour, an hour and a half maybe, and described everything I was doing with my Samurai. And of course my Japanese is advanced of course, but it does come with practice and the earlier, the, the sooner you start the better. So um, to walk in Japanese is aruku, aruku, aruku. The gentle version, arukimasu, arukimasu. To run is Hashiru, hashiru. Gentle version, hashirimas, hashirimas. Watashi wa ai, watashi wa arukimas. It means I walk. But if you want to say I am walking, you can say watashi wa aruiteimas. So I am conjugating again. The suffix changes, and I'm conjugating. Arukimas becomes aruiteimas. Aruku becomes aruiteiru. Now, if you choose not to use the gentle version or the tene, and you actually choose to use uh, aruku and aruiteiru, then it would be better not to use watashi but to use boku if you are a boy or atashi if you are a girl. They are more informal and they stick better with the with this way of conjugating verbs. So it will become boku wa aruiteiru. Boku wa aruiteiru. Again, for emphasis, you can add yo at the end. Okay, well, I hope that this was fun. Try it. And if you like this idea, I can actually make a whole series. Choose a topic, for example, the weather, uh, animals, 
fruit, anything, link it to a video game and teach you that language. If you're interested and if you think if this is, could be a good idea, let me know. For me, it's not a problem. I, I do this all the time. It's my job. That's what I do. I teach my students to learn languages. If you want to learn that, you want to know more, let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching as always. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. Arrivederci. Sayonara.